This video is going to help you think about what's going on with objects that are involved in vertical circular motion. They're following a curved path, and that curved path happens just to be vertical, not horizontal. Like, let's say, a mountain biker going through a loop, vertical loop like this, or the bottom of a hill of a roller coaster. At the bottom, they're following a part of a circular curved path. Or if you're cresting a hill in a car, when you're going over that hill, you are following part of a curved path. In this video, we'll think about the forces involved in these types of situations. Up until this point in class, we've just talked about horizontal circular motion involving objects that follow a constant radius of curvature path that just happens to be in the horizontal plane. For instance, a car going around a turn like this, or an amusement park ride where somebody's swinging around in a horizontal circular path at a constant radius. Well, we know that in all cases of circular motion, where the speed stays constant, we know the sum of the forces on the object in that circular motion has to be pointed towards the center of the circular path. So in the case of the car, it's the frictional force that's pointed towards the center of its circular path. In the case of the amusement park ride, the sum of the forces on the rider is actually just the X component of tension. That's what's pointing towards the center of their circular path. So coming back to our examples of vertical circular motion, we know that no matter what's going on with the forces, in each case, whether it's the mountain biker at the top of this vertical loop, the sum of the forces has to point towards the center of its circular path, which would be down, or the roller coaster at the bottom of the hill, the sum of the forces has to be pointed up, that's the center of its circular path, or the car, when we add all of the forces together, there has to be something more left over pointed down than up, so the sum of all the forces is, again, pointed towards the center of its circular path. We're going to specifically look at two quantitative example problems with a biker moving through a vertical loop. We're going to focus on the forces they feel at the top of the loop and at the bottom of the loop. So let's look first at the top of the loop. So the question reads, what is the size and direction of the normal force on a 100 kilogram rider at the top of a vertical loop with a radius of 3 meters? And it says, assume the bike is moving with an instantaneous velocity of 7 meters per second at the top of the circular loop. Well, we know the sum of the forces has to point down, no matter what else is going on, but what are the forces in the biker at this point in time? Well, all objects with mass will feel a gravitational force. A 100 kilogram rider is going to feel a gravitational force of approximately negative 1,000 newtons pulling them down, right? And if they're in contact with the vertical loop as they complete this thing, if they're in contact with it, that means the loop is going to be pushing back with a normal force. And since the loop is above them, the loop is going to push back downward with a normal force. And so we think there's going to be a normal force, and we'll, I guess we'll calculate that in just a minute. But if there is, it's going to be pointed down. And no matter how big the normal force is, we know that, well, these are the only two significant forces the biker feels. So the sum of the forces will be equal to the sum of the gravitational force and whatever that unknown normal force is. So let's first start by calculating the size of the sum of the forces, because we know the mass of the rider, we know the speed of the rider, and we know the radius of curvature that the rider is following. We should be able to figure out how big the sum of the forces has to be on a 100 kilogram rider moving at 7 meters per second along a radius of curvature of 3 meters. If it needs to be bigger than 1,000 newtons, that means there has to be some additional normal force contributing to the gravitational force, so the sum of the forces is bigger than 1,000 newtons. So let's find out how big that needs to be. So our circular motion equation is the sum of the forces pointed centripetally or towards the center on any object moving in a circular path has to be equal to its mass times the square of its speed divided by the radius of curvature that that object is following. If you're in AP Physics 1, remember this equation is not given to you on the AP equation sheet, so you have to kind of derive this or kind of put two other equations together, one being Newton's second law and the other one being our centripetal acceleration equation, which is the V squared over R. So let's just plug in the values that we have to solve for the needed size of the sum of the forces for this rider in this particular instant. So the rider has a mass of 100 kilograms. They're moving at a speed or tangential velocity of 7 meters per second. Square that. 
divided by the radius of curvature of 3 meters, turns out that the sum of the forces needs to be 1,633 newtons in size. Remember, this equation tells us how big the sum of the forces needs to be. It doesn't tell us what direction the sum of the forces needs to be. Well, we know the sum of the forces has to point towards the center of the circular path. The center of the circular path is below the rider, and so the sum of the forces has to be in the negative direction. And so the sum of the forces is 1,633 newtons in size, but it has to be negative. If we don't get the sign right, when we plug our values and signs in here, we're going to get a wrong answer for the normal force. So let's now solve for the size of the normal force using our net force equation in the y direction, right? If we add up the forces, we've just got the gravitational force plus the normal force. And we know that the gravitational force is negative 1,000 newtons. We just found that the sum of all the forces on the rider at that instant has to be negative 1,633 newtons, and this is our unknown normal force. So let's just solve this for the normal force by adding 1,000 newtons to each side of this equation, and we end up getting that the normal force is equal to negative 633 newtons, because we've got our negative 1,633 newtons plus 1,000 newtons that we added to on the left-hand side. So the normal force is 633 newtons in size, and it has to point downwards. Let's see what the forces are at the bottom of the loop. So our question reads, what is the size and direction of the normal force on a 100 kilogram rider at the bottom of a vertical loop with a radius of 3 meters? Assume the bike comes to the bottom of the circular loop traveling at 14 meters per second. In our last problem, we assumed it was moving at 7 meters per second, and you can well imagine that as they go down the loop and make it back to the bottom, they're obviously going to be picking up speed. So let's say they're just moving at twice the speed they were moving at the top. Well, regardless of the forces involved, again, any object following a circular path, and at that instant, if the speed is not changing, just their direction is changing, and that's the case for the bottom of the loop because the instantaneous velocity is to the right, the sum of the forces is up, and so they're just going to be changing direction, not speed, just at the instant of the bottom right there. Well, how do we get the sum of the forces to be pointed up or in the positive direction in this case, which is towards the center of the circular path that they're following? Well, they feel a gravitational force. We know that's negative 1,000 newtons just like before. And they're in contact with the bottom of the loop, so the bottom of the loop will be pushing up. But if we need the sum of the forces to be pointed up, that means the normal force has to be bigger than 1,000 newtons, so that when we add these two forces together, there's more in the up direction than the down direction. So to solve for the size of the normal force, let's first figure out how big does the sum of the forces need to be. So again, we're going to use our circular motion equation. So they have a mass of 100 kilograms. Now they're moving at 14 meters per second, and we have to square that but they're still moving around our circular loop of a radius of 3 meters. When we plug the numbers in, 100 times 14 squared divided by 3, we get that the sum of the forces needs to be 6,533 newtons, significantly more, because they're moving at a greater speed. Remember, this is the size of the sum of the forces. It doesn't tell us the direction of the sum of the forces. Well, the sum of the forces has to point up because that's the direction of the center of the circular path, so the sum of the forces has to be positive on the biker at the bottom of the loop. Now let's go back to our net force equation in the vertical direction to solve for the normal force. We know the sum of the forces has to be positive 6,533 newtons. The gravitational force is negative 1,000 newtons plus our unknown normal force. Again, let's add 1,000 newtons to each side, and it turns out that in this case, the normal force has to be 7,533 newtons. That's like seven and a half times their weight. Hopefully these two example problems will help you start to think through what's going on when an object is involved in vertical circular motion, whether it's a rider in a car, a roller coaster, a bike, or anything else moving in a curved path in the vertical plane.